All right, so good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our continuing series called Environmental Fridays. And our guest speaker today is Colleen Fruin. And um, the topic that she's gonna speak on is pollution and wildlife. So Colleen is, um, has a Bachelor of Science degree in wildlife ecology and management. Uh, she obtained that from Michigan Technological University back in 2014. Um, she went to public high school in Southwest uh, Chicago and spent most of her time there in the arts and sciences. Was it a specialized school or something? No, it wasn't. They just had a pretty diverse uh, offering. Okay, all right. Um, um, she's worked as a utility forester. And um, you guys could ask her what that's all about. Um, and then she attended MSU to get prerequisites done for veterinary school. And for those of you who might be interested in veterinary school, you might have some questions for her as well. She has a husband and two dogs. Um, and she enjoys hiking and kayaking in free time, in her free time, and um, enjoy studying the links between ecology, toxicology, and disease. So it's an honor, pr privilege to have her here to speak with us today. It's yours now, Colleen. Okay. Well, thank you guys for having me and thank you for letting me lecture here today. So I'll just kind of jump right on into it. Okay. So uh, today we have here the link between chemistry and ecology, and then we're gonna go into a bit of a case study. So uh, you did a great job introducing me. So I won't spend too much time here, but as mentioned, I have my bachelor's of science in wildlife ecology and management from uh, Michigan Technological University in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And I kind of chose to go there mostly because it is surrounded by nature and they have such a nerdy science culture on campus, which I loved. And it just kind of helped immerse you in the sciences from the start. Um, so if anyone does have questions also about Michigan Tech, I could be more than happy to answer those as well. Um, I took a lot of pre-veterinary medicine coursework for my first two years, and then I switched into the wildlife ecology and management program there, which is a very small hands-on program, which I also love to do because it is so small and hands-on. And one unique thing about that program is you spend one full semester in pretty much the woods with 40 of your classmates and you're in class from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. every single day, and you love it, and you spend uh, your last few weeks managing 80 acres of forest, and you come up with a management plan for that. So if you also have questions about their forestry program, let me know. Um, but other than that, I did grow up in the Chicago Southwest side um, suburbs there, and then I moved to Michigan to work as a utility forester where I pretty much managed forest land across, during, um, across power lines and then decided that was not my favorite activity. So I just decided I wanted to go back to working towards veterinary medicine. So I now work as a veterinary assistant in the suburbs around East Lansing here. And so now I'm working towards veterinary medicine as a uh, degree. And so if you hear my dogs barking, I'm sorry about that guys, but they're kind of rummaging around here. And if you ever want to send me an email, feel free to shoot me an email. So um, there's that for you. So kind of moving along here. Uh, so a quick overview of what today's going to look like for you. We're going to start off by kind of talking about the link between chemistry and ecology because it doesn't always look very direct. And then we're going to go on to some vocab that we're going to get to know and then some case studies and a questions if you guys have any. 
So where chemistry meets ecology. And I'm going to warn you, the next slide is going to look very um, overwhelming, but don't worry, it's not as complicated as you're going to think. So um, here it's essentially we have ecology starts kind of at the top here, but then it ends up being there's these foundations, which I'm not sure if Desmond would agree with me, but the foundations at the bottom, and then there's kind of what I'm considering a little bit more of the applied sciences where you're going to be maybe using them a little bit more in your career paths. And then, um, so what we have here is then chemistry and biology, and of course, math is vital in everything we do and can't really be forgotten. So from there, we're going to build upwards towards more advanced chemistries and detailed yet broad biologies. Then for a moment, we're going to kind of flip to building upwards and look from the top down to see what ecology encompasses. So of course, you have wildlife, which is broken into the smaller classes. So I kind of grouped them all together where you have ornithology, mammalogy, herpetology, ichthyology. Um, so ornithology is your birds, mammalogy, mammals, herpetology, reptiles, snakes, amphibians, ichthyology, fish. Um, and from there, you're going to have your landscapes where you have water, soil, vegetation. So geomorphology is your landscapes, geology, hydrology, waters. And then you're going to go into a large topic commonly forgotten, but equally as important is sociology because people come into play when it comes to ecology, you can't really forget them. Um, and we kind of, what laws we make come into big play of how we construct our environment. Um, if we go hunting, that's gonna be a really big play into what animals are taken out of our environment. So what we do has a really big impact on our environment, so we can't forget sociology. So then from there, um, when we really kind of start getting into the middle of it, ecology and chemistry is where we meet with such subjects as water chemistry, toxicology, physiology, and water chemistry is going to determine such things as pH of water or nutrient content. This will go on to determine what life forms can grow within the water system. Toxicology is going to be chemical substances that are not necessarily bad for any one living creature but at what concentration does it become okay um, or become toxic? This can affect what flora and fauna go on to live in that ecosystem. And then um, physiology of any plant or animal can go on to determine if it's more susceptible to disease. Uh, this connect in ecology and chemistry as well as just some of the subjects an ecologist considers are just the broad spectrum. There's many more that I couldn't fit on this page and would look way too messy. So um, this is just a little snippet of what you guys are gonna even see today. And let's kind of dig into it a little bit and keep on going. So next up we have some vocabulary. So from the vocabulary, we our biggest word that we're probably gonna use a lot today is eutrophication. And for this, um, some of these words you guys might know, um, and some of them might even seem obvious, but they're really important for you guys to know in ecology. Sometimes we have these words and we come up with these definitions, but not all ecologists use them the same, which is kind of weird and unfortunate in ecology, but um, is kind of how it goes for us. Um, so with eutrophication is when a body of water becomes enriched with dissolved nutrients. Common nutrients you might be familiar with are nitrogenous compounds and phosphates, especially those are the ones we're gonna be talking about today. These stimulate, uh, stimulate aquatic plant life and reduce dissolved oxygen within the water. Eutrophication overall causes a shift in the ecosystem surrounding the body of water due to changes in water chemistry. And then next up we have intermediate hosts. These hosts uh, to parasites are required for plant parasites life cycles to continue. They play a crucial role in a specific stage of the parasite's life. They can be more than one intermediate host within a parasite's life cycle. 
Um, and just to really note here, they are required for the parasite's life cycle. So they can't skip one of these intermediate hosts. They are needed for an intermediate host. Um, then we have our definitive host. And these are going to be when a parasite is an adult and is considered reproductive. And depending on the host's own behavior, this can have implications on spreading the parasite as well. And we'll discuss this a little bit more in our case study. So the definitive hosts and intermediate hosts is, they are two different things, but they're both required in order for this parasite to live and have a full life cycle. So then we go to non-point source pollution and our non-point source pollution is when pollution does not come from a direct source such as a factory or sewage plant, but is runoff from a field or a street is kind of two of those examples there. And these types of pollution is typically harder to discern from um, since it's not always a direct source. So it's not something that you could really just take a measuring cup and put it underneath a water tap essentially. And it's something where like rain comes through and washes pollution into the water supply and it kind of leaches into the system. It's not a great definition, but unfortunately, when you go and you look up like the USDA's or EPA's definition of it, it's essentially a non-point source pollution is the opposite of point source pollution. So point source pollution is what we have when we have a sewage treatment plant dumping their sewage into a water source. Um, so I know that these some of these words might have been new to you guys and hopefully I was able to explain them fairly well. Are there any questions before we move on since some of these will be a little important during today's lecture? Are there any questions on them? I know there's a hand raise function, but I also don't entirely remember where to find it. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Okay. No questions. Okay. Okay. Then we will keep on going. So next up, we're going to go on to our case study, which is going to be nitrogen runoff leading to eutrophication, resulting in increased riboruria endontre parasitism in amphibians. So that is quite a word, riboruria endontre, and I'm just going to shorten it to riboruria for the term purpose of this lecture. So Riboruria is an aquatic parasite, and this aquatic parasite starts off as, in the class Trematodia. This class is a group of flatworms, also called flukes. Most trematodes start their life cycle as a, in aquatic snails. And this one particular requires two intermediary hosts and one definitive host. First is the aquatic ram's horn snail, and the second is a various species of amphibians, including northern leopard frogs, green frogs, and long-toed salamanders. All of these can be found in Michigan. And the definitive host is a typical species of bird, as herons and ducks, and it kind of varies from just anything that will eat a frog or salamander along the way. So we will take a closer look at the life cycle a few slides down and then the disease state caused by riboruria that we will be focusing on today is limb malformations and amphibians and the mechanisms by which these disease state is not yet known. So however, riboruria does appear to be targeting the, tad, the limb buds on tadpoles. So the limb buds are with the little parts where the limbs start to shoot out on tadpoles. And so the problem with extra limbs, and this is the disease state, is extra limbs and limb malformations. So predation is really one of the bigger problems. Um, so typically malformations and the, the bones that they have, they typically don't have the ability to move. Um, even though they have bones and muscles, the legs also have the ability to hinder the movement of their actual legs that do have the ability to move, um, which makes predation and escaping from that a lot harder. As one could imagine, if you have something like blocking your leg, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work. Um, then also it's not only making escaping harder, the extra limbs 
also give their predators um, something extra to grab onto when they're trying to get away. So something amphibians may not make it to is mating um, because they're having increased predation as well as increased difficulties just during mating since there are limbs in the way from their mating rituals. So when we have that, um, the one concern that we have is amphibians start to disappear with these extra limbs. Um, it starts to sound alarm for ecological problems that their anatomy and physiology is making them prone to small changes in chemicals as, I'm sorry, let me back up for a second guys, got a little bit derailed. Um, so one other concern we have is when amphibians start to disappear or turn up with extra limbs is that they are great for sounding alarm of ecological problem. Their anatomy and physiology um, makes them prone to small changes in chemicals within their environment, including changes from climate change and that causes increased temperature and UV radiation. Amphibians have very thin skin, so this allows for gas exchange since their skin is part of their respiratory system. Then their skin, their thin skin makes it very absorbent to these chemicals within their environment. So the amphibians can kind of help us alert us to problems within their environment when these pollutants come in because it's absorbing these chemicals. Um, but that also means that they're first to start disappearing from the environment. So when we have these things in our ecosystem, it kind of makes this big impact when the um, frogs are disappearing from their limbs and they're disappearing from chemicals. It's just a really big problem for frogs. And then all of a sudden the status of amphibians on our planet is very threatened. So next we're moving on to this life cycle of Ribariria. And we're kind of gonna start off at the ram's horn snail at the top. So we're gonna start right there at 12 o'clock and we'll start there and go. So the first intermediate host, and this is the Mercadia stage of the um, Ribariria. So Mercadia stage is essentially a free swimming ciliated larva. And this upon, takes upon residence in the snail and it develops, a, develops into Circeciae and where they leave to find it in the second intermediate host in the amphibian. So the amphibian is a fully aquatic portion of its life cycle where the Circeciae find it. And this means it's in the tadpole stage for frogs and toads and then aquatic larval stage for salamanders. And then here the Circeciae become metacariae and they can insist and go on to a dormant stage in the amphibian. And then the definitive host will go on to eat the amphibians and the metacariae will emerge as adults. The definitive host, typically a bird species, has the ability to infect amphibians and go on to fly a great distance. So their water systems can be contaminated with ribariria. And this has the ability, sorry guys, <laughs> has the ability to um, go on and spread through different waterways. So then it can kind of become a, a really big problem, but at the same time, you're sitting here going, why has this not been plastered all across the news? And you're going, I haven't really heard about this maybe too much. And well, it kind of deter is determined on the individual and the amount of deformity it has is based on <laughs> the amount of ribariria within the system. And I am so sorry that they have decided to bark today. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Okay. There's other dogs out there and they just cannot be bothered. Okay. So when we have a lot of ribariria within the water system is when we're going to see a lot of malformations. So if there's not a lot of ribariria, you might not see any ribariria malformations within the frogs and thus for they're not going to be a lot of birds getting it and picking it up and being able to spread it and there's also an environmental part or portion of that so now we're going to kind of move on to the environmental portion of what causes that spike in ribariria so now we have eutrophication root eutrophication is going to be that environmental spike that's going to cause ribariria to just burst up in population. 
So eutrophication comes into play is they have found a correlation between increased water nutrients has led to spikes in algae blooms, and that leads to an increase in ram's horn snails. So our first intermediate host is that ram's horn snail. And in one study, they looked at water nutrients that was increased. What happened is that the algae population and the snail population increased when they increased high nutrients. So when we look at our first graph, we see that our high nutrients are the full on black dots. And then when we have high nutrients going up, that is gonna be prophyric. This purified on uh, chlorophyll A is our algae. And so when we have a high nutrients going up, our algae bloom is going up too. So over time, it's causing high rises in algae. And then when we go on to our next graph in the middle here, we're gonna see the same impact with snail eggs. So snail eggs are also going up as an impact of this high nutrients in the water. And then when we go to snail biomass is that's how they chose to measure the snails after um, they have hatched and snails are going up after this. And so we now have our first intermediary host is way up there in population. So now this leads to an environmental imbalance. So this is really going to cause this weird imbalance in the ecosystem that allows riburia to now suddenly have this tons of hosts that it could just go into. And this just allows us to really note that these environmental imbalances lead to riburia populations being able to find a new house, essentially. So then we're gonna kind of switch gears a smidge to talk about another impact that this can have. So now we kind of have this dilution effect that can come into play. So with that, we're gonna explain the dilution effect with something that you guys might be a little bit more familiar with. And that is um, our uh, Lyme disease. So Lyme disease here, uh, we have the black legged tick and the Virginia possum and the white footed mouse. So for the dilution effect, we have the white footed mouse where it will groom ticks off them, eat them, and it can also spread the disease. Virginia opossum will eat the ticks that it grooms off them, and it can also not get uh, Lyme disease because the temperature within the Virginia opossum is too low to host the bacteria. So if you get rid of the Virginia opossum, it can no longer, you're going to have the black-legged tick only feeding off the white-footed mouse. You'll see a peak in Lyme disease. If you bring the Virginia opossum back, you'll now see a decrease in Lyme disease because the black-legged tick has another option for feeding. So if you reduce your biodiversity by taking out your Virginia opossum, you're gonna increase species risk for disease. Now, if we move on to how we apply that to our own example with using Ribariria, you're going to see increased water nutrients are going to decrease your dissolved oxygen, which are going to increase your algae and increase your snails. Now, this one is maybe a little bit more abstract to think about, but essentially what you're doing is you're increasing your intermediate host, which is allowing for increased disease risk because you're having one species that's um, unbalancing your environmental impact. So you're going to have greater opportunity for your infections, which is leading greater opportunity for your amphibian infections, which is then essentially leading to predation from your definitive host. So moving along, we do have extra nutrients. Where are they coming from? And this is where a lot more of our chemistry is going to kind of come into play. And here, a lot of it's coming from our agriculture. So um, within agriculture, uh, a lot of it is from the USDA, they're quoting about 83% of ammonia emissions and 54% of ammonia emissions are being contributed to agriculture right now. And with agriculture, there's a fertilizer component where urea and feces and undigested nitrogen are released back into the environment. And agriculture is typically a non-point source pollution contributor because you can't really just 
they're not dumping it from one source. It's leaching back in typically through groundwater or um, just rain running it off. And that's how it's typically getting back in. It's not just someone dumping it in. So then we're gonna keep going on and talk about the irrigation side of it. So typically there's irrigation side and then the farm animal side. So in the irrigation side, we have 7 billion pounds more of nitrogen than the plants can actually even use, put onto farm fields a year as the USDA is kind of giving us this number. So what that kind of means is that all this extra nitrogen is gonna get put back into the environment through water runoff, through leaching of the water back into the soil and water systems. The other problem with this is that it could also burn the roots of the plants that it is surrounding. So then these plants that are sitting there, they're gonna get their roots burned, they're not gonna grow as well. So they're gonna use even less nitrogen than what's on the field. And this also just causes problems for farmers so they don't wanna put extra nitrogen on their fields. So next up, then we're gonna have this non-uniform water application, which is also seen as a big problem to irrigated agriculture and nitrogen leaching. So when the water is being placed onto the fields to irrigate it, it's not always placed on the fields in a uniform manner. So you're gonna have less water being placed in certain areas, more on other areas. And when it's placed in more on other areas, you're gonna have more water being leached into that area, pulling the nitrogen down further. And when it gets pulled down further, it's gonna get leached in and then put into the groundwater system and then you're gonna have more nitrogen runoff and then that nitrogen's gonna put back into your environment. And then it's gonna go into the groundwater system where you're gonna have more water, nitrogen into your water system being able to cause this eutrophication cyst problem. So then topography within the crops, and this is kind of where this photo is coming into play is where I'm sure you guys have kind of driven past crops. And then we have this weird spot within the middle of the field where there's no crops growing, it's just a mud puddle. And there's these micro topographies within crops that cause all these problems where you're going to have nutrient sinks and it's just going to dig in there and you're not going to have any nutrients getting in. And that's going to be the same problem um, that I'm, it's essentially kind of repeating myself, unfortunately, but it's just always going to kind of come back to this problem of you're going to have these sinks of nutrients and that's where you're going to have your problems. So, but then we're gonna get into a little bit of a more interesting problem, I think, where you're gonna have climate change and with drought. And with drought, you're not gonna have these great growing years. You're gonna have dry soil. Dry soil, you're gonna have um, the wind that's able to brush away anything. And so if you're having nutrients sitting on top of the soil and there's no cover crops, the wind can actually erode all of that soil and take the nutrients with it. So then if there's a nearby water source, all that nutrients is gonna land on that water source and be able to cause eutrophication to that water. And then with drought, you're also going to be able to have more irrigation. So if there's more irrigation to that drought, during that drought, you're gonna have more of our non-uniform water application. So it's gonna be kind of this positive feedback loop during a drought season. And then also with climate change, we're noticing change in our weather patterns in terms of snow, at least in the Midwest. So then we have snowpack where snow is not always now freezing and we're not having as large of a snowpack. So it's not holding the nutrients down. So when we have snowpack, it holds the nutrients in place until thaw. And then when we have a thaw, it's typically during when our growing season starts. So those nutrients start to become available as the plants start to grow. And then it's a perfect balance because the new plants start to be able to use those nutrients as they're becoming available. And then we don't have a problem with our nitrogen imbalance. But right now there's nothing holding that nutrients there. So it's either leaving or it's becoming, or it's becoming available too early for those plants to use. And then it's no longer there. So that's kind of our problems right now that we're having with our agricultural side. And then we get into our animal agriculture. And for me, this is a little bit more of my favorite part. Um, we have animal waste, which is a big part. And as of right now, animals are producing about 110,862,000 ,000 kilograms of nitrogen per kilometer, square kilometer of agricultural land 
a year in the United mm. States. So with that, that's a lot of nitrogen waste. And what do we do with it? So farmers tend to reuse it as fertilizer for crops, which is great. Um, but as we're going to kind of take a look here, uh, animal nitrogen waste is not always the best. So when we're working as an animal producer, when we have an intake of protein, that protein, as we're going to take a look at this diagram here, we have true protein and this NPN protein. For the sake of today, we're going to kind of ignore this NPN protein and just look at true protein, which is going to be what the animals are consuming as their feed stuff. So when we look at this feed stuff, we have degraded intake protein, and that's going to be the food that they intake that gets degraded down into amino acids and they're everything that they're going to use to turn into nutrients that the body can use. And then we have undegraded intake protein, which is not going to get degraded. It's not going to get used. Essentially, it's going to become their feces and they're going to be just pooping out nitrogen and it's not used. And nitrogen in a feedstuff in protein is very expensive. So when you're making food for an animal, nitrogen is your most expensive part and you want to use as little as humanly possible. So if you're a farmer that's producing food for your animal and they're just pooping out nitrogen essentially, you are losing money there and it's also causing environmental problems. So when we want, to, when we look at animal nutrition, we want to look at are they get, taking in what they're putting out and are they putting out too much? So here, if we look at animal nutrition, feed them properly, they're going to be putting out less and we're going to be spending less. And that's going to help our environment and going to help farmers. So then the next problem we have is what to do because they're still going to poop no matter what. Um, we have feces storage. So feces storage, there are environmental laws in the state of Michigan. So we have to follow those laws and it depends on the size of the herd that you have on how that's going to be stored. But it is a matter of uptake on how you are storing those. So to kind of bring things back full circle, we have a treatment toad, Ribereria odontrae, that uses two intermediary hosts and one definitive host. The ram's horn snail is your first intermediary host and it increases with eutrophication from soil runoff, typically caused from upstream agriculture and nitrogen runoff. And your nitrogen runoff is gonna be caused from your farming, typically from up, upstream. So then solving the problem, we have our Clean Water Act, which is gonna be caused from the um, is going to be something that could help us. That's a national, on a national level. Uh, we have another national level, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, and that's just going to be there to help farmers uh, through monetary help as well as they could just help them give them advice on what to do. Uh, cover crops will help reduce soil from being eroded. And then field buffers grow along the edges between waterways as well as um, the farmland. So that way, anything that goes uh, to the waterway, it's stopped. And then Michigan is a zero discharge standard for release of nutrients into the surface waters. And that essentially means you can't just be dumping anything toxic or your fertilizer into the soil. Um, that's just a big solid no. So some sources for you guys and then questions. I know that was a lot in <laughs> a little bit and I probably could have gone longer, sorry guys. But what kind of questions do you got for me? Okay, any questions you guys have? I have a few um, while you think about your questions. So um, just to sort of like, in, you know, summarize to some degree, what you're saying is that nitrogen, well, what's the problem with nitrogen? Yeah, so um, nitrogen essentially gets put back into the environment's waterways. And then that causes the imbalance in the water system and it becomes a dissolved um, nut nutrient in the water, which causes the water to, um, sorry, my dog is distracting. 
it is becomes a dissolved nutrient, which then allows algae to grow and then dissolved oxygen decreases, which then allows the algae to bloom. And then you get your increase in snails. And then that increases your riboriria, which then causes your increase in frogs having their extra legs. Okay. So you go from increased nitrogen mm -hmm. to increased growth in vegetation, you know, um, plants, and that causes an increase in snails. Is, am I doing that right? And yep. then increase in, from the increase in snails, what was the next one? So it causes an increase in snails, and then the increase in snails allows there to be more hosts for the riboriria, and then that allows there to be more riboriria, which causes there to it to transfer to the frogs. Okay, and and destroy the frogs basically. Mm -hmm. So okay, um, I have um, a couple of questions. Um, of all sources of external or artificial nitrogen, what is the most potent or harmful when released into the environment? So this is from Sean. Okay, and sorry, I'm just trying to go where the question was. And then, so can you, I'm sorry, can you say the question? Oh, here we go. Of all yeah. sources of external nitrogen. It's in the chat, the last one in the chat. Okay. So, for the means of this uh, presentation, it would most likely be fertilizer onto farm fields is going to be where most of that harmful environmental pollution is coming from for riboriria. Um, in terms of on a global scale, I would have to do more research for you. But for this one, it's going to be fertilizer onto farm fields is what's causing the biggest problem. So, so I have a follow up to that. So mm -hmm. what is what is uh, the most common nitrogen containing fertilizer or fertilizers? So most fertilizers that you buy are going to be a uh, nitrogen, like an ammonia phosphide type base. Mm -hmm. And so some farmers use a premixed nitrogen rich fertilizers. Some are going to be using animal feces, which is high in nitrogen typically. And so it kind of depends on the farming. If you're doing a more organic style farming, my guess is you're going to be using more animal feces since that's considered organic material. If it's something where you're not organic, you're going to be using that pre-mixed high nitrogen uh, soil mixture since typically in soil science, you're looking at nitrogen, potassium, and uh, phosphorus for your soil mixtures. So this is connected to another question, like why do they have so much extra nitrogen? You said 7 billion pounds mm -hmm. extra. I mean, why, why do they apply so much nitrogen to the fields in the first place? Um, my guess is they think nitrogen, so is on education is going to probably be my main answer there is nitrogen helps plants grow. So essentially they think more nitrogen, more growth, but that's not really the case. It can be detrimental to your growth because it can cause that root burn and burn the roots and then that stunts growth. So um, most of the people, they don't know that it can do that is my guess. and when you meet an age old farmer, they're like, this is the way we've always done it. And, but nowadays we do have these great agricultural programs at schools such as Michigan State and other universities where they can learn about how to better care for their crops. And there's a lot of kids in those programs now where things might start going a little bit better. Okay. So this question is from Jonathan. Mm -hmm. Could you explain how this parasite causes amphibians to have an abnormal number of limbs or limb de deformation? Yeah, so they unfortunately don't fully know the mechanism as to how it's causing the, de the deformations right now. All they know is it's kind of attaching to where the limb buds grow on the tadpoles. So the limb buds are where the legs start to shoot out and grow. So 
my guess would be it has to do something about the cells within those areas is where it's kind of doing a chemical change within mm. there. What specifically that change is, we don't know yet. Um, but it's causing changes in cell structure, it's causing regeneration right now, and why we unfortunately do not know. Okay. Um, I'm assuming you're familiar with the herbicide called atrazine, mm -hmm. because that's another um, source of um, toxicity, if you will, to, to frogs. Mm -hmm. uh, my understanding is that uh, atrazine um, causes, um, especially male frogs, to become female. Are you familiar with that? And what's the, do we still have widespread use of atrazine in agriculture? Um. I'm familiar with what you're talking about, but I do not, I'm not familiar if people are still using it right now. Okay. Okay. Um, Joko had a question. I guess we're gonna end up here pretty soon. What's your proposed solution? I know you said something on your last, was it your last, second to last slide? But yeah, we could go back a little bit too. Let me... So here's some of the things that you could that we could be doing to solve the problem, which is um, laws and regulations can help for sure. So reducing nitrogen uh, use is definitely helpful. One of the other things that I've been reading about is reducing how we use our water consumption on fields and crops. And then as well as um, what I was talking about animal use is making sure that what the animals are eating is appropriate for how the, the animal itself. So if an animal's eating too much nitrogen that they don't need to be, if they're just gonna be excreting it, that's not gonna be helpful. Uh, making sure farmers are using the right amount of nitrogen on their fields and uh, complying with how they store their products and how animal feces are stored is gonna be very helpful in reducing uh, nitrogen being released it back into the environment. Okay, so one last question. Can we see the dog? <laughs> yes, we can see a dog. Sassy. Oh. <laughs> She's coming. She's on her way. Come on. Okay, here's, here's one. That was from Madison. Okay. Well, thank you guys. I could well, also. We, oh, I don't think we saw the. Did we see the dog? You may have to like. Oh, I might have to stop screen sharing. Yeah, let me. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Hold on. Sassy, come back. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Here we go. There we go. Oh, Alex is showing her dog too. What kind of dog is that, Alex? Um, this is Calvin. He's kind of been here the entire time. Okay. He's been waiting for the dog too. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's give a round of applause to Colleen for a good presentation on pollution and wildlife. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you very much. We'll be in touch. <laughs>